of Jordan. Um, we set up a nice community-based animal health workers program. We had our animal health workers trained. We dialogued with the community about the need to pay for services and how that was a sustainable system and the value of it. We'd link to two pharmacies, and we had a nice network, and we, we were all set. We had a, a project that looked like it was going to go places. And in our area, a disease outbreak occurred. Um, nothing terribly significant, but something we were, we were tracking. Unbeknownst to us, uh, another NGO got wind of the disease outbreak <laughs> and determined that the best thing to do would be to blanket cover the area with antibiotics as a means to help the local farmers. So literally trucks rolled through the villages and drugs were handed out to slightly bemused Bedouin livestock keepers, but nobody was saying no. Um, the consequence of that are, um, you know, the, the business at the pharmacies trickled to a, to a virtual standstill. The animal health workers who we'd worked with and trained and invested in um, received no income at all. There was nobody wanting to pay for services. They, they dropped out, and essentially the entire project was collapsed. Now, the project that gave out the, the drugs had, had good intentions, and indeed those drugs would solve the problem. But I think one of the principles that's enshrined in the LEGS guidelines is, is one of do no harm. Um, and livestock programming can be complicated, and often there are unintended consequences. And I think the, the guidelines provide a, a, an excellent structure, very much based on experiences, to ensure that those unintended consequences are minimized uh, down, down to the lowest level. Traveling across the, the Red Sea to Ethiopia, um, and by way of contrast, perhaps a, a more positive example. Uh, Mercy Corps was implementing a long-term, multi-year um, development assistance program, which had substantial livestock component. Yeah, this was in the Somali region of Ethiopia. Uh, these are some of the people we were working with, uh, developing veterinary pharmacies and the supply of, of drug delivery through uh, animal health workers and looking to support livestock trade. In the middle of that multi-year assistance program, a drought started to evolve in the area that we were working. And the Mercy Corps team were, were required to reconfigure the program to address the urgent emergency needs. Now, adhering to some of the principles and guidance in the legs, the team were able to do that in a way that worked through the people that we were already working with, strengthening the animal health systems that we've been working on, but using that as a mechanism to deliver emergency assistance, rather than in the previous example, side, sidestepping those guys and coming in and meeting the immediate need, but undermining their businesses and the enterprise. I think the evidence showed that by working through the teams we were already engaged with, we were able to act more rapidly. And undoubtedly, although the businesses coming out of the drought were somewhat bruised and battered, they were still standing. And there was some structure of veterinary infrastructure and service provision that was there in place for Mercy Corps to be able to help support the early recovery phase. And I'm pleased to say that having protected their enterprises and allowed those businesses to keep functioning and providing services, we're still working with those same people in the same region today, supported by USAID funding. Um, and should the, the need arise again for them to revert back into a more emergency mode, a mechanism is now in place that the, the experience of implementing using uh, the LEGS guidelines and those mechanisms has shifted the paradigm of thinking and the way that emergencies are handled in that region. So that was a very positive experience. The final one, again, another drought. Um, we, this was working with another agency, uh, previous, previous to Mercy Corps, and a drought situation arose. We, we felt on, at the field level that the conditions were suitable for a, a commercial destocking operation. We had farmers who wanted to sell. The market prices were, were collapsing. And we had traders who wanted to buy. They wanted to take livestock out to a, a strong end market. All we needed to do was just facilitate that exchange and do that in a timely way, and we, we could protect some of the livelihoods and realize some, some added value of the assets that people wanted to destock. The problem was at that time, 
commercial destocking wasn't a recognized approach. And this created a hesitation. There was a, a very interesting and somewhat frustrating dialogue between our team in the field and our headquarters. Finance people got a little bit nervous. A few people suggested, did I mean restocking, not destocking? And that went backwards and forwards a little bit. And the hesitation that the moment was lost Emergency programming to be effective needs to be timely. And in the, in the hesitation, and it was a reasonable hesitation because this was an untried technique, but it, it cost us dearly, or it, cost, it didn't cost us that dearly, but it did cost the livestock keepers quite dearly. So I think the, the guidelines provide that go-to, pre-thought through, structured approach. There are different options when in the emergency phases they should be implemented. There is a credibility that the technical agencies have, have garnered that the donors have bought into. So they facilitate uh, an early discussion, uh, even to the point of pre-thinking through contingency planning responses before any crisis ever even emerges so that teams are ready, that they have pre-thought through some of the things to enable that decision-making to take place early. And again, if you're working with an agency that may not have highly specialized field teams or maybe working with partners who have less experience in terms of working in livestock emergency implementations, these guidelines provide a great tool around which discussions can take place. And I would call out the decision support trees in the document, which um, I find very useful in working through whether sufficient conditions are in place and, uh, and that intervention is appropriate and also the, the PRIM, the participatory response matrix, which I think we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about later. My final thought is just to echo what Andy concluded with his talk about, is that um, the LEGS platform is more than just a bunch of standards. There is a tremendous resource contained within this and on the website. I thought the first edition was great. Uh, we found tremendous value and utility in that, so I'm very much looking forward to going through the second one. If this is easier to use, that's great. Um, but I think this platform for continuing learning and sharing experiences, at Mercy Corps we value innovation strongly, and so there is this opportunity. When I started my career, commercial destocking wasn't an option. It may now be one of the, the strongest options. But I'm sure out there there are other interventions, livestock insurance, response to zoonotic crises, voucher programming. There's lots of areas where this field can continue to evolve. And I think that the LEGS makes a fantastic platform for that learning process and improvement so that we all get this more impactful livestock programming. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. And um, Thank you very much, yes, to Ofta for, for hosting us here. So good morning to everyone in the room, and good morning to everybody online. Okay, so what my my bit is going to be a little bit different to um, what 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 we've just heard. Um, you are actually going to get the chance to do something in this session. So we thought it might be interesting for you to take a look at one of the actual tools within the handbook which is the Participatory Response Identification Matrix. That's the last time I'm going to say that. From now on, it will be called the PRIM. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so the PRIM is a tool that's, that's um, within, within the LEGS handbook and something that can be used in the field in a, in, in a real emergency, as it was. But it's also something we do in the training materials, so it kind of can give you a flavor of both things. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that, this, this here is a picture of what it looks like, or what it did look like. Um, and can you, can you actually see it? Okay, all right. So, yeah, that, the first, that one is a picture of somebody, you know, a, a group of people actually filling it out. Um, it's important to probably say that LEGS is very practical. So there are tools throughout the handbook for use at the different phases. So really the, the stages that re the LEGS handbook refers to are preliminary assessment, followed by then response options identification, and then once the sort of broad response identification has been selected through a participatory process, 
then there are tools within the handbook to look further at kind of technical issues or considerations around specific technical op um, options. And then obviously, finally, there are tools for looking at monitoring and evaluation. So we're going to be looking at stage two, the PRIM. Um, <clears throat> so what is the PRIM? It's basically a participatory, well, it uses all the findings from initial assessments. Um, and then basically, it's used as a to facilitate discussions with different stakeholders. So there may be a, a broad range of stakeholders in the room. So um, kind of a global comment for all our presenters. Yeah, stay closer. OK. Um, to identify which op interventions are the most appropriate. So one thing I want to say about the PRIM, and you're going to do one in a moment, there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong answer. The results of the PRIM will reflect the kind of decision making and the discussion between the stakeholders in the room at the time. Um, this is an example that we of doing a real one. Um, this was after the flooding in Pakistan, um, and there. <clears throat> I could pick out the different people, but a range of different stakeholders discussing what they thought would be the best technical options um, for the response to the floods. There are two, well, actually, there are three types of PRIM. We, we use there's a, a slow onset PRIM, a sudden onset PRIM, and also a PRIM that we can use for complex emergencies. Um, you will, if you look in your handbooks, because um, you've all got your handbooks there, uh, sorry to the people online, but you can probably, can they download it online? Yeah, so you can download it online. You'd have to be pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> on page 58, you can see uh, an example of uh, the, the table. And if you can see it online, this will be useful for you to have a look at for the following exercise. Um, OK, so the slow onset prim basically differs from the sudden onset purely in the emergency phases. So the emergency phases for the slow onset are alert, alarm, emergency, and recovery. Whereas you'll see, I don't know why that one's there. Um, whereas, and you'll see with the rapid onset, then we've just got the immediate aftermath, early recovery, and recovery. But you'll still see that the livelihood um, objectives stay the same. So how can we provide rapid assistance to animals to, to, for survival of animals? How can we protect um, livelihood assets related to, to livestock? And how can we rebuild those assets? And then you'll see in the left-hand column, there's all the technical interventions. So those relate, obviously, to the technical chapters. And those are the kind of various broad response options that we have available in, in the PRIM. OK, going back then, <clears throat> the idea is then to fill out that table with some scoring against the objectives. So I mean, the scoring can be anything you decide within, within your decision-making process. But there are guidelines in the handbook just for your information. So there you've got five stars for that response identif that response option we would have significant benefits we feel or the benefits are appropriate three stars some benefits a few benefits very little benefits or it wouldn't be appropriate and then we also look to think about when that response option might be appropriate. So would that be in the immediate aftermath? Would it be in early recovery? Or would it be in recovery? And we would make a mark on the matrix to indicate that. So I'm going to go through um, <clears throat> an example one. And this is from a rapid onset emergency, an earthquake in Asia. And this was the result of their prim. Um, it may alter in, in, in different situations, obviously, and it depends on who the stakeholders are in the room. But what they came up with was that destocking was not appropriate. Um, veterinary services were, support to veterinary services was appropriate and became much more so when they were talking about rebuilding assets with the objective to rebuild assets. Um, and they saw that as, as something that could go through all phases of the emergency response. Um, with feed, again, um, much more appropriate in uh, protecting and rebuilding assets and in the immediate aftermath. Water was not such an issue in that context, but would have been provided in the immediate aftermath. Shelter was, you know, did, they did feel would have some benefit um, and all the way through to recovery. 
Um, again, provision of livestock or restocking, not appropriate to begin with, but in terms of rebuilding assets, very appropriate um, and in the recovery phase. So that's a kind of example of one <clears throat> that was actually filled out. Um, okay, so we're going to do a little exercise now. Um, I'm going to ask just, no, actually maybe it's pretty much even. So if you're sitting in a blue chair, you're going to go to that flip chart at the back with Julie and Shannon. And if you're sitting in a brown chair, you're going to be going to that flip chart at the back with Dana. And I'm going to come around, Andy and I will come around in a moment and give you roles. But just for the time being, I just want to tell you the context that you're going to be filling out your prim with. Um, so this is this was an earthquake. Um, there were 9,000 cattle, buffalo, sheep, and goats killed by the earthquake. Um, <clears throat> luckily, a lot of livestock had already been taken out to graze um, that day. Otherwise, losses would have been even higher. Um, and animals had been left to find feed and water as all the immediate relief um, efforts were focused on people, which is quite a common um, thing. So that's the kind of basic. A few more details. The situation of the earthquake was compounded by the fact that there'd been um, a drought for two years previous to the earthquake. Um, and this had led to lack of forage and pasture. And had also, the earthquake then caused the collapse of many uh, water tanks and veterinary buildings. So that's the situation you're working in. OK. so. Let's go to the back, and we'll give you your roles. Oh, no, you didn't. Okay, okay. And a very simple
Alrighty folks, um, the participants are shifting back to their seats and uh, the presentation will resume shortly. Please return to your seats. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your um, enthusiastic participation in that. And I have to say, um, the group on the right, the group in the brown chairs, managed to actually complete their prim, which is stunning because that can sometimes be hours long process. Um, about, but I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of reflections from you. And um, how was it for you? How, how did the exercise feel in terms of transporting that exercise to a real life situation? Hi. Yeah, it was uh, very good because you, because we had the different roles, you could see the, the sort of tension between what NGOs want to try and provide based on their budget and their understanding of the situation and, for example, what the smallholder farmers wanted um, from theirs. And sometimes it's not always the same. So it was just interesting to try and see how you can negotiate that and, and explain to, you know, to the beneficiaries how the situation um, is. So, yeah, it was very, it was very real. Thanks. And just to pick up two points on that, thank you for mentioning that affected people were there, um, because I think that's one really important part of the process. Um, and, and secondly, it can sometimes give you an opportunity to manage expectations too, because you know budgetary constraints are real things and, and so on. So yeah, great, thanks. Any other reflections on the exercises? And one then here. It was really interesting in the discussions how uh, people came up with some things. We still need to be selective or strategic in the way that some of these interventions might be rolled out. So, you know, looking at particular uh, areas of weakness and or areas of strength, and not just uh, applying something across the board. Okay, great, thank you. And there was a reflection here. Um, I was a bit conflicted about what are the things as a smallholder I need to think about. For example, do I still have a house, or where are my kids going to sleep? So I think also it would be helpful to think around um, what are the other support uh, rebuilding mechanisms in place. Sure, and I, and I think that's a challenge as well, you know, to be able to combine responses so that, yeah, all the needs are being met and not just sort of specific ones. But, yeah, that's, that's a very good point because you, you would have felt very conflicted, especially if it's very soon after the disaster. But, yeah, thanks for that. Any other final reflections? Okay, well, thank you all very much for participating, and I think Julie is going to wrap us up. Yep. Clicker, Emma. So, um, since we started about 15 minutes late, we'll tack on an extra 15 minutes to our previous end time for Q&A uh, after Julie's uh, quick presentation. Will it come up? Oh. Okay. Don't go crazy with the clicker. Um, go, go, up, go back. That one. Slide 17. 17. Oh, no, no, it must be 37 then. 37. <laughs> <laughs> We are finding the slides. It's that kind All right, of day. here we go. That's the big goal. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for coming in today. Um, and to those of you online, I hope you're still in your pajamas, which is what we all wish we were doing. Um, anyway, so I want to discuss today trends in general in the humanitarian community in terms of livestock. But primarily, I wanted to share my perspective from within the US Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is OFTA. Um, that's where I've been for the last 10 or 11 years, and um, I feel best suited to speak to that. So. Oh, um, my slide got changed. OK, um, I just briefly wanted to cover how humanitarian aid for livestock has changed. What are some of the driving forces of that? And what kind of tools are sharpening our response capacity? That's a pretty tall order for an eight to 10 minute talk, so I'm sure there will be gaps, but I'll talk quickly. Um, OK, so uh, I shared this graphic for two reasons. Um, you can see on the top the number of responses that we had in fiscal year 13. OFTA responded to 52 disasters in 40 different countries. Um, on the bottom graphic, you can see how much money we spent responding to those disasters. And I shared these for two reasons. One, to really highlight the diversity and number of disasters that we're faced with every year. And two, to really highlight that there's a limited pool of funds to respond to these disasters. And so we need to respond in a way that's um, more effective and more efficient and ultimately better for our beneficiaries. I thought the bottom graphic was quite interesting. I don't know if you can see the text, but it highlights some of the countries which had the larger responses. Many of those countries are countries where livestock and pastoralism play a large role in people's livelihoods. And so I thought that was interesting to reflect on. The way that we fulfill our mandate to save lives, alleviate human suffering, and reduce the social and economic impact of disasters is by providing funding to our implementing partners on the ground to provide life-saving um, emergency response and also to look at early recovery and resilience activities. Unfortunately, the job on the ground for our implementing partners is getting a lot more complicated. There you are, implementing partners. Um, you know, people mentioned restocking and handing out sheep, sheep and goats, which used to kind of be the knee-jerk reaction. So much so that we handed out so many sheep and goats that we started just calling them shoats, which is not an official term, but one that people tend to use within our circle. Although then Shannon came on, who is a veterinarian, and she informed me that it means something totally different for veterinarians. So. I've also had people call me and say, what is this mythical animal, the shoat? Does it really exist? So, um, so the job on the ground has gotten a lot harder for people who are doing programs. Uh, we're dealing with complex emergencies. We're dealing with areas of chronic stress where livestock keepers have had repeated exposures to shocks, where they've lost um, common coping mechanisms. We're also considering areas for livestock programming that are in active conflict. So handing out animals isn't just an issue of who needs an animal. It's thinking about um, if you distribute animals in one location, is that going to create tension between two different tribes who share a water resource? Um, is it going to create a protection issue by handing out a high value animal? So there's a whole different background to these programs. Um, and maybe it was already there, but we've started taking on this as part of the humanitarian response. There's also the issue of displacement. I don't know if any of you have ever walked through an IDP camp that's full of animals. It becomes an exercise in avoiding um, piles all over the ground. And I think it highlights the need for, I don't know where my slide went. Um, Yes. Um, OK, so areas of displacement. Programming also becomes about getting people in camp locations where they can have access to their animals, where their animals being in the camp aren't contributing to hygiene and sanitation issues. Um, displacement also causes disruption in traditional migration patterns for livestock. So looking at the potential 
health implications for animals and humans that that disruption can have. And then finally, um, we're dealing with cyclical responses. I don't know how many of you have responded to at least one drought in the Horn of Africa during your careers? At least two. At least three. OK? So these things are not going away. They're coming back again and again, which really highlights the need to get it right the first time and start addressing some of those underlying issues. Um, because a 12-month emergency program just really isn't going to cut it anymore. <clears throat> Sorry, that says do no harm. Um, so OFTA's mandate includes saving lives and alleviating human suffering. But I think perhaps of most importance to the livestock sector is the part of our mandate that includes reducing the economic impact of disasters. And something that all of our speakers have touched on today is about um, doing responses in which we allow local markets to function as they would, to look at market-based interventions, um, to remove ourselves from um, creating dependence and ultimately hindering resilience. We as a community need to support development of responses that enhance the ability of local markets to function and that don't distort normal coping strategies in times of stress, and ultimately that don't undermine already fragile ecosystems. And I, I know you're all aware of it. We had some lively discussions in my group about adding animals, taking animals away. Um, but these are some of the issues that come up when we're thinking about programming in a way that does no harm. So how do we do this? This is a lofty goal with lots of different moving parts and components. Um, I think the first trend within the humanitarian community is looking at assessment-based interventions. Um, there's a great example of the EMMA, Emergency Market Mapping Analysis Tool, which has just been used in South Sudan to look at livestock markets and look at bottlenecks. And I think that um, the results of that are really going to enrich our capacity to do more interesting responses and ultimately more effective responses. And then the other trend of sharing best practices, lessons learned within a community of practice, um, I credit LEGS for. It's the amassing and sharing of lessons learned and best practices within this community of practitioners. And if you look around AID, there aren't many of us, but we all show up to the same, um, same webinars. And, and so we're here, and we're working on these issues together. And I think the same goes for the broader humanitarian and development communities. Um, I'd be really interested to count the number of years of experience that went into the LEGS um, handbook. I know that you've all had numbers of years of field experience um, that really enriched the text. And I think save those of us who don't have that experience a lot of time um, out in the field. I also feel that a tool like this is so important because with the limited resources, I shared our global funding responsibilities, 52 disasters in a year. Funds are not, unfortunately, unlimited. Um, and so we really have a responsibility to spend that money wisely, not reinvent the wheel. And also, for the sake of our beneficiaries, um, they should not be subjected to trial and error interventions. We know what works in a lot of cases. And I think that this book helps our practitioners get there. So for those of us that have not dedicated our lives to livestock, I think this book is an essential tool to getting it right in terms of program design, in terms of approaching humanitarian livestock interventions from a common platform of knowledge and best practices, and in terms of doing the best that we can to address not only acute needs, but some of the underlying causes of fragility and crisis. I wrote that, and then I read it, and I felt like a light should shine on the legs book because that is a tall order. I mean, all of those different elements. And I, I truly believe it. I think it's a, a guide that, um, if we use it across the board, will ultimately result in supporting our beneficiaries the best way that we can. So um, thank you. Uh, so let's give a round of applause to our panel. Questions. We have some time for Q and A. Uh, so, questions at all about anything you've heard today? Um, please raise your hand, and also please, if you wouldn't mind, stating your uh, name and organization. And I don't know if our online audience 
has a question ready to go, since they've been so patient today, uh, why don't we throw it back to them for the first question? Or do one in here first? All right, questions. For, all right, so we'll get one in person first. Yes, right here. Uh, th thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the exercise. The question I have is usually after an emergency, there's lots of confusion, um, incomplete or imperfect information, and so forth. To do a prim or other planning exercise, I think you need to recognize authority of some sort. How, what do you do if there isn't one that's functioning? Um, so you have a command structure or a, a known entity to which people can report and support. I'm Phil Steffen from USA Bureau for Food Security. Are we taking a number of questions or going one by one? Two one and one. So. Um, Andrew, you want to take that one? Um, was the, can I just clarify? The, the question was, what do you do if a, if a kind of existing coordination structure isn't in place? Or um, I'll try to clarify. I'm sure there, as we did in the exercise, there are a lot of stakeholders. Yeah. And they're all gravitating. They all want to do something. How do you decide who's in charge and establish lines of authority, channels of communication, perhaps funding as well, especially if there isn't one, if there's not a functioning government to think Somalia or maybe Darfur or some other place. OK, all right. Um, I think all I, all I can really say is about my own ex experience about what happens. Uh, and I think in situations where in the immediate aftermath there isn't a clear coordination body, in my experience, what happens is normally one of the UN agencies would would appear on the scene in, in one form or another and take on that role. Um, and that's in, in a livestock situation, of course, one would uh, assume that that would be FAO, but it's not always the case. It really just depends on who's on the ground at the time, in my experience. I think, of course, Somalia is a special case because of the, uh, the increasing problem of accessibility for international organizations and, and so on, and uh, organizations having to work remotely through local partners. Um, in terms of legs and how that affects livestock projects, which these local partners may be doing through some remote coordination, perhaps in another country, I don't actually think we've we know what's going on, to be honest, and the extent to which those those projects that might be implement, implemented by those, those partners are are following legs or on what basis they're being done. I'm not sure we know. Maybe just to add to that, the, there is, when you have a fragile government or one which has limited capacity, I think there's an opportunity through the LEGS guidelines to promote good governance of a situation, inclusive decision making of stakeholders in working out solutions, ensure private sector is represented perhaps in the, in the discussions about way things go forward. So for where there is a, an established authority but they maybe don't have tremendous capacity, um, I think that it, getting out in front and helping those authorities to sort of understand a little bit of the background to legs ahead of coordination and try and support them. I think it, the Ethiopian government has taken on quite a lot of the, the, the principles within legs and is increasingly doing a better job of emergency response in a livestock context. All right. Any other questions from our in-person audience? Here we go. My name is Moffat Gugi from uh, Bureau for Food Security um, in Washington. Uh, one of the discussion points that has come, been coming out a lot is sort of the relief to development sort of paradigm. We've been talking a lot about that, uh, and both governments, um, you know, a lot of donors. I mean, Julie already sort of alluded to that in terms of how how it's sort of recurrent kind of crisis. So, to what extent do you see legs sort of fitting? 
in that um, sort of continuum as sort of emergency, so that you kind of getting on to the long-term development. Okay, I, th I think I get it. I think for me, when we talk about livelihoods-based approaches and thinking, which on which legs is is focused? That that livelihoods approach is not just thinking about uh, the assets and so on that, that people have in protecting assets. It also looks at uh, supporting and not undermining existing services, structures, markets, and so on that are already in place with a view to, to maximizing opportunities for rapid recovery afterwards, because recovery is partly based on the functioning of those systems and services. So a livelihoods-based approach, that, that, that thinking is, is inherent in it. And I think the other aspect of LEGS is that we, we talk about uh, preparedness for emergencies, risk management, these kinds of things. Um, and from my, from my own perspective, uh, particularly my experience is mainly in the Horn of Africa, I think we're still struggling with the concept that we know that droughts are going to happen in the Horn. In any given time frame, let's say five to seven years, we know that there will probably be at least one or two major droughts in the Horn almost inevitably. We don't know exactly when they'll happen, but they will happen. And yet, every time there's a drought, it kind of comes as a surprise for some people, I think. So integrating risk management and drought management into long-term development processes is a logical way of of handling these events, we know it. We know it's going to happen. Um, so if you if you look at it from that perspective, the language of or the thinking of relief to development doesn't quite apply. We should be thinking about development where we expect setbacks, where we expect some bad things to happen, but we can kind of figure out what they will be, even if we don't know when they're going to happen. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Any other comments from the panel, or no? Um, all right, I'll pass it back here. I'm Dave Dupra, a retired agriculturalist. I worked. I had the benefit of age. Sorry, could you put the mic closer? Thanks. Like this? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. I worked in the livestock projects in West Africa back in the 70s and 80s. I'm wondering the development of legs here. Uh, oh, sorry, and what that to to told us, what that taught us is that prevention is better than the cure. So they developed all kinds of programs to address the what we call the sechares in those days, the drought, including pit silos and water storage facilities and all that kind of stuff. So when the next drought came, that the farmers were a little bit better prepared than they were had that not been there. Uh, to what extent has LEGS used the lessons learned from West Africa? Because today seem to be pretty much focused on the Horn of Africa. Okay. Um, I, my, my personal experience is, is more um, in the Horn of Africa. Um, and I, I, as Andy explained in the evolution of these guidelines, that they, they started with, in Nairobi. But the process became quite a broad and global one, um, and I think I think many of the we, we have mostly because many programs in in West Africa right now we use these guidelines and implement them. Much of the systematic thinking and the, the conceptual frameworks are absolutely applicable. Uh, to your specific point about what um, what lessons learned from West Africa have informed what, what's gone into the LEGS guidelines. Perhaps Andy's better qualified to say, but I understand there were a number of consultation processes held on a regional level as part of the synthesis of the document. So my, my understanding is that West African experiences were absorbed into the guidelines. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, the, um, when I mentioned, mentioned earlier on that we, we went through a, I hope quite, comprehensive process of reviewing uh, evaluation reports, impact assessments, research, and so on. Um, 
globally. And certainly uh, documents from West Africa were, were an important part of that. And I can, I can specifically remember uh, reviewing documents from Mali, Niger, and other countries, uh, looking at experiences of, of drought response in those countries. And um, the consultation process that we went through certainly included feedback from, uh, I remember particularly, I think, Oxfam GB in West Africa from, from VSF in West Africa and, and other organizations. So uh, from my perspective, kind of West Africa was, was, certainly, was certainly in there. Yeah. Um, why don't we just get a quick snapshot of what our online conversation has been focusing on and see if they have a question of sorts, and then we'll come back to the in-person audience. Sure. There's been a lot of talk on um, how do we encourage host country governments and institutions to prioritize livestock emergency planning. Uh, particularly when governments in the most vulnerable regions may not have uh, the funding available for creating and implementing uh, like these emergency guideline standards. Any comments on that? Oh. Oh. Um, it's a good question. I think um, perhaps the the broader question is how do you work with governments, again, for more of a development setting to understand uh, the benefits of livestock and how they might be uh, investing and supporting livestock development more generally and the kinds of things they can, they can do to do that. And then within that, of course, emergency response should be, should be part of that. If you're trying to develop your life, livestock industry, commercialization, trade, and so on, um, and I think it's it's been a challenge in some countries um, to get livestock on the agenda, even in countries where livestock clearly play a major role in uh, in economies. It's changing in some places, uh, but there's there is still an issue, I think, that on the, on the general agendas, policy priorities, funding priorities of governments, um, livestock doesn't receive the attention that it, it deserves. Um, I'd actually be interested to hear what, um, what Jim or, or Joyce have to say about that, but I think it's still an issue. Um, but really, unless, unless I think you get livestock on the agenda at the kind of uh, broader economic development, economic growth, kind of uh, position. Then talking about livestock in emergencies and expecting government money to appear is, is a long shot. Maybe just a, re a reflection on that is sometimes I think what doesn't help is the way countries do their accounting on the value of their livestock sector, which is frequently their number of animals traded off and export traded. If, if, if we could encourage the socioeconomic analysis of the way livestock's valued, the internal trade, um, the value, it, it, the reduced costs of safety net programs, and those kind of <coughs> ways of looking the total total factor value of livestock to the economy, then the, that becomes a more compelling case. And that methodology is a little compl more complicated and needs a little bit more explanation. But I think Legs also made a point to look at some of the cost benefit analysis of timely action um, and, and looked at that from an economic perspective, as a classical economic perspective. I mean, I remember being stunned by the cost-benefit ratio for early commercial destocking. It's, it's the highest I've ever seen for any single development intervention. Um, so, you know, I think that getting the evidence out there, using policymakers to gather and develop that evidence so that they're internalized into the thinking process, open their eyes to the role that livestock plays and the increasing role, this livestock revolution that's going on, is changing minds and policymakers and that process can be accelerated by some, some smart policy studies. Um, my name is Joyce Turk, formerly of AID. I'm, um, well, two months ago I was still there. 
<laughs> At any rate, uh, you have not mentioned AU IBAR and the role IBAR would possibly be playing if whether or not they already have dedicated individuals or a unit within it for this type of work. So what's the relationship then between and among uh, various donors, implementers, and then AUI bar in this realm? That's your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Joyce. Could you just clarify what, what the question was? I didn't pick all of it from, from here. The African Union. Uh, hmm. What, for animal resources, what, what do you think the, the role of the African Union? The role of IBAR and whether or not IBAR has individuals on its staff who are either dedicated as professionals within IBAR to using the LEGS guidelines right. or not. Okay, for those, perhaps for those of you who don't know, IBAR is the Inter-African Bureau for, for Animal Resources, uh, which is the livestock uh, technical office of the African Union. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with, with current staff capacities in, in IBAR. Uh, what, I, what I do know is that um, the African Union itself, at a higher level, has policy frameworks, such as the, the policy framework for pastoralism in Africa, which came out in about 2009. And within that policy framework is uh, a section on drought management, because uh, it's a policy framework for pastoral areas, which does refer to legs and legs-based approaches and drought risk management as uh, a priority for pastoralist areas. And that, that, that policy is in the Department for Rural Economy and Agriculture in the African Union. Um, the extent to which the specific um, lakes type elements of that are being promoted by, by IBAR, I don't know would be my, my answer. I think at the AU level above, above IBAR, there's a good understanding of lakes. Uh, but specifically within IBAR, I'm not sure. All right. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of whose hand I saw first. I think I saw yours pretty early. Hi, uh, Mike Gelsdorf, and I'm a veterinarian, and I've worked in animal disease control programs. I can't hear you. Really? <laughs> you can't hear me. Is that better? Mike Gelsdorf, I've worked, I'm a veterinarian. I've worked in animal disease control and eradication programs. So when you have these catastrophes, do you have in your book here, as far as addressing livelihood and emergency phases, um, Usually when you get livestock together in camps or whatever, um, some of the livestock bring diseases in, and the, and the diseases spread rapidly. So do you have a way to address that? Um, well, I think that would be um, part of the initial assessment that, that was done in terms of what your response would be. Um, there's no, I don't think there's any kind of blanket response that I would recommend with what LEGS advises that this is an initial assessment which understands a particular context and that that context in, in this in this example that you've mentioned about camps would depend on the types of livestock the types of diseases that were that were likely to be a problem in a particular area and, and so on and you would you would base your your response on that analysis. So in the assessment is... As a general principle, it's accepted that bringing livestock, you know, when animals come together in an unusual situation and congregate in a, in a camp setting, then yes, you would, you would expect an increased risk of certain kinds of diseases. But specifically what those diseases are, um, um, how you would handle it would be context specific. Right. Well, are, in your assessment then, do you do any testing? 
be of, of the li of the livestock, just to get an idea. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to figure out what um, what the risks were. Um, but but bear in mind, you know, in these situations, often you you're not in a position to do things like um, you know laboratory diagnosis of livestock diseases um, or really go and examine lots of animals. It may be that you're having to make decisions on very imperfect information on the views of local veterinary officers if they're there on, on livestock keepers and so on. Um, and even then, of course, if it's an unusual situation where, where animals are coming together, perhaps people have had no prior experience of that, so they don't actually know what's going to happen. So, the, you know, it's, it's a judgment call, largely, I would say. We are we're reaching the end of our time. I saw there's one question over here. Um, but then we'll have about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, for those of you who want to stick around for the second part of our event today, we'll have um, more coffee and just refreshments available out in the hallway. And then we'll um, come back for a discussion of community animal health workers with Andy um, for about the next hour. And so you're welcome to stay for that and could maybe even get in a legs question or two uh, at that point as well. So let's take our last question for now. Hello, thank you for the presentation today. Um, I'm a vet from Mississippi State University, um, and I'm spending time with USDA Foreign Services right now. So I have a question about how to create a sustainable legs program in areas that are further complicated by high conflict, um, political instability, and then also in an area with high government personnel turnover, who should we be focusing on to champion the legs effort in these communities? Okay, how do you how do you create a sustainable legs program? Is that that's the question? Do you mean a sustainable in terms of a specific legs type intervention in terms of sustainable veterinary care or sustainable feed or sustainable water or are you thinking more at the organizational level? About how to get the culture of legs into a community that can function even with the added conflicts and instability that happens around it. So you can address things like droughts and flooding and our classic disasters. Okay. Well, I think at the community level, this is at the level of, of livestock keepers, I think many of the, um, the things that LEGS recommends, they would already try and do. And uh, Commercial destocking is a good example of that. If you actually give people the capacity to sell a few animals and get some cash, what do they do with the cash? They invest some of it in protecting their remaining animals. And they do that without people like us having to tell them to do that. Um, so at community level, I think there's a, a capacity there and an understanding of what the priorities should be and so on. In situations of essentially weak governance and, and chronic conflict and high turnover of agency staff. At the, at the level of, of agencies, of, of UN agencies, international NGOs, at that level, it's, uh, it's partly a question of normalizing legs at higher levels in terms of their own organizational good practice and guidelines and procedures. So I think uh, to give you an example of that, I think FAO emergencies department in Rome now refers to legs as part of their internal guidelines for their people in terms of how to uh, assess responses. But of course, it's not just having the guideline. They then have to go further and make sure that their staff are actually aware, trained, and do actually follow their own guidelines, which is a whole other organizational process. And similarly in, in international NGOs. So it may be that uh, some of the larger NGOs, Mercy Corps being an example, would say, OK, when we take on new staff, we need to orientate them. We need to brief them on what is good practice in different sectors, make them aware, send them on training courses, and so on. There's a whole lot of activity around this. Um, and at government level, it's really a similar process. It's about normalizing good practice. In Ethiopia, as Andrew mentioned briefly, 
they actually produced a national guideline on, on drought response in pastoral areas before Lakes was published, which actually uh, does commercial destocking in Daniel Lake and so on. That's published by the Ethiopian government. Um, but there are challenges in terms of how they actually turn that guideline into action, capacity issues, turnover of staff, and so on, as we know, effectively. And that's, that's in Ethiopia, where you've had a very stable government for a long time. In situations of, uh, of weak governance or no government, I think you just have to do the best you can. You have to constantly try and make, make people aware and be, and be realistic. Training, awareness raising, it's a continuous, it's a continuous process, I would say. I hope that yeah. partly answers your question. I think others on our panel have further comments. Julie? I, it's a continuous process, but um, I think sometimes we worry about staff turnover. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but quite often in areas where the government maybe is falling apart, it's not that functional. A lot of those staff actually go to our NGO partners um, and then circle back around. So I think as long as the donor community is pushing adoption of standards and guidelines at some level, and their staff attend trainings. Then their staff are working closely with Ministry of Ag, livestock on the ground, um, even community animal health workers. So it goes at a bunch of different levels. And I think there's staff turnover all around, so people kind of cycle through and hopefully pick it up somewhere along the line. Emma? Yeah, no, I was just going to reinforce the point about uh, staff turnover, that you know, generally they get a job somewhere else. So back to unless they're retired, and then often they have more time to do the championing. So I, just to make a comment on the champion, championing, it is a really important thing to have, but I don't think there's sort of a typical profile for that champion. You know, they can come from very unlikely quarters. Um, but I think an important thing for us as legs is to support them, so be providing with information, uh, you know, new, new research, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we've found in the process those champions have been very important to getting legs out there, so yeah, and then supporting them. Just final thought, maybe <clears throat> successful programs are very marketable. So <clears throat> if you do good work, you follow the legs guidelines, I think emergency program people focus on that phase, and that is the important phase, but to capture that experience. I was the beneficiary in my presentation of people who captured some of Mercy Corps' uh, previous experiences. So just to emphasize the lesson learning, impact assessments, documentation, and maybe to take that one step further, have the partners you would like to influence in country, a government person, be part of the team that does the impact assessment, that if they believe and see with their own eyes the success that's happened. It's not an NGO, overly inflated success story, but it's real, tangible, and they're involved in a sort of partially independent review of it. I think that, that stays with countries and with local partners, and they may rotate through different agencies, but the documentation is often a weak part, and if people are engaged and participate in that documentation, I think that can leave a lasting legacy of a success. Great. A lasting legacy is a good note to end on. Uh, so thank you very much to our panel. I guess we'll give them one more round of applause. Um, and thanks to all of you for bearing with us through a few uh, technical difficulties. So we'll take about a 15-minute break. And then if you'd like to stick around um, and chat with Andy for a presentation about community animal health